Hey guys, those were some photos I took of this set back when I first got it. And here it is now, just about completely done. The picture tube repair was a success, and I've gone through an alignment. Uh, I think the only thing left to do on this electrically is install a new power cord, and then I'll move on to the cabinet. Before I do that, though, here's a look at it playing. This set has a really nice picture, I think even better than the last two sets I restored with this same chassis. Just remembered one thing I want to try though is a little circuit modification to eliminate these retrace lines that become visible when you really crank up the brightness. But even without it, uh, which is quite nice I think. Clean a little goop off the screen before I put this stuff back together. A little lacquer thinner should take care of that. Thirty-nine dollars down starts your car insurance today. It's the best deal in town. Call Lincoln Auto Insurance at eight 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 four one nine zero six seven six, or visit them online at lincolnautoinsurance.com. When you see text like this, black and white, you can really get a feel for how good a, a set is aligned. And this is nice and crisp. Yeah, lost in space. I installed a retrust suppression modification and it works quite well. What you do is you cut this orange wire here which would normally go right to the brightness control here and you install this 270k resistor in series. This green wire here, that's the one I cut, that's when it goes right to pin 2 on the picture tube. And at the junction of that grid and this resistor, you install this capacitor, which ties in down here, which is on the signal to the vertical output transformer, this guy. So what this does is this imposes a little blip onto that brightness signal, which is normally just a DC level signal controlled by the brightness control. Well, those retrace lines, that's when the signal, so normally it zigzags back and forth and it slowly works its way from the top down to the bottom. Well, then it's got to fly back up to the top and start drawing the picture again. But when it flies from the bottom back to the top, that's that zigzag squiggle that used to be on there. Well, with the circuit in place, it puts in a signal of the right polarity at the right time to block out that signal while the electron beam is flying from the bottom back to the top. And, as we can see now, I can crank this brightness up all the way. No retrace lines. Not sure you get some distortion, but that's just because you couldn't drive the picture tube this hard. But otherwise, no retrace lines. All right, I say this chassis is all ready to go back into the cabinet. Here's a dry run of the chassis back inside the cabinet. And I'm happy to say everything seems to line up properly, so I think I can proceed with the reassembly. Something kind of cute. 
I think all of my Admiral TV sets mention a rotoscope antenna option, but I've only actually found the antenna in one or two sets, this being one of them. What this is, is an internal antenna element, and it's got this paddle here, so you can switch out the elements. So either you get the full X pattern in circuit, or you get two of the elements, one of the other two elements. I've never actually tried using one, but I think this will be a great opportunity, so once I get this set all back together, I'm going to rig up one of my Blonder Tongue modulator TV transmitters, and let's see how it works. Now, as for where this antenna goes, it actually slides up inside the cabinet. There are a couple channels up here where the uh, threaded holes are that hold the back on. Well, they cut this to the right size, it just slides up inside, and this connects right to the antenna terminals. And there's a note down here on the antenna terminal. Before attaching any other antenna, disconnect rotoscope leads. So that would be these leads. Now a little paddle that controls the switch, that sticks out the back here. And there's a corresponding slit cut in the metal back which sits on like so. It's a little bit rusty, so I'll get some rust remover going on that. I found this set in Omaha, Nebraska and had it shipped up to Chicago. And when I got it, it was extremely dull and uh, faded. Uh, I presume it was uh, just baked in the sun for years and years. Now back then I didn't have a whole lot of experience with Bakelite and this seemed like a very daunting task so I went online and I read up on all the various crazy ideas on how to polish Bakelite and I tried them one by one by one over the course of about two years. Here's a little photo montage of what I went through. I think now you've got some idea of how much fun I had working on this cabin over the course of several years. Here is a summary of what I found worked and what didn't. First off, if you get a cabinet that was as dull and dirty as this one was, uh, I suggest cleaning it with something that has a mild abrasive in it, like Brasso or I even use toothpaste. Uh, I imagine baking soda would work fine too. Basically something that has a bit of an abrasive, use a, a damp sponge and get it nice and clean. After that, uh, I'd try polishing it with something like Novus Number 2 or, an, an, or a more fine abrasive, uh, even metal polish. I've heard there's something called metal armor or Simichrome works. Basically a finer grit than this. And if that seems pretty good, I would go to wax. In the past, I had been using Meguiar's Tech Wax. But just a few days ago, I was reading online about Meguiar's Cleaner Wax. So I ran out and got a can of this to paste wax. Put it on with a sponge, let it dry to a haze, and then buff it out. And this stuff works even better. I really, really like this stuff. So that's, that's my wax of choice right now. Now in the case of this cabinet, after the coarse and the fine polishing abrasives, it still looked really really dull and that's because this thing had been sunblasted and the dullness was actually in Bakelite. 
So I needed to remove a layer, just a thin outer layer of it to make it darker. For that, I went to wet sanding. I think I went down to 600 grit and then up to 3000 grit. And then a the note was number two. And then uh, some chrome and then cleaner wax. But that's only for a clamp that's really dull. Uh, I'd be very wary of just jumping in and trying to sand something. And if you do, I'd say start with something like this, which is 2000 grit. It's a sanding block, both sides. Get it nice and damp, and then just uh, lightly sand it. Now, there were some other products that I showed in those photos, and both of them looked fantastic at first, but they both faded over time. And I think the reason is that these both contain oil. This is orange oil, this is mineral oil. So they're basically they're like furniture polish. Well, but this is a furniture polish. And this is designed for plastic and Bakelite. And there are people online who swear by it and say it never fades, but for me it faded. Uh, so if you don't mind reapplying them every few months or a year or so, by all means. Uh, you can put this on a really dull cabinet and forget about some of these stuff so it'll look great. But I found that uh, not only did it fade, but actually it feels a little bit tacky because you actually got oil and wax on the surface, especially the oil, and it kind of like attracts dust and feel, will, the fingerprints will show. So, uh, yeah, that, that's my advice. Uh, take it or leave it. <laughs> it's what works for me. I know other people have other ideas about what works with Bakelite. I went over the cabinet with wax one more time. And I think that's plenty good enough. So I'm finally going to move on to assembling the entire set. Also, put on the back for a little dry run, and it is a great fit. And here it finally is all back together. Next up, I'm going to rig up one of my blunder tongue modulators, which can serve as a low power TV transmitter, and see what kind of picture I can pick up. So this set is kind of in my TV corner, <laughs> where I've been setting up all my sets lately. And all my AV equipment is in another room, so I want to see if I can transmit from that room to this room and still maintain decent picture quality. Let's a closer look at it. I'm quite happy with the way it turned out, especially considering how beat up the set was when I first got it. Okay, I've got the set plugged in and the internal antenna hooked up. First I'm going to see how I can pick up the local low power channel 6 station. Then I'll try out my own little transmitter. Not bad. I think the antenna is just in the middle position right now. So now I'm swinging that lever to one side. Well, that makes it worse. There it is in the middle again. There it is on the other side. It's pretty good too. Definitely has an effect. 
pretty significant effect. Say for this station right in the middle is the best position for it. Now I'll hook up my blotter tongue modulator. Okay, I've got my transmitter set up, I think on channel 9. There's little dip switches on the front you use to set the channel. So if this is 6, 7, 8, Wow, that's uh... Final six episodes. It's working fantastically. Provided by Nation. Nation's early draft scripts showed some. This is a little uh, DVD extra from uh, the, story the first incarnation of Doctor Who. Oh, I'm not even trying to adjust anything. <laughs> That's already a pretty damn good picture. All right, so that's with the antenna lever in the rightmost position, and there's the center. Okay, this one actually on the left, flipping it to the left uh, makes it better. Oh, that's... It's been a while since I used this blonder tongue modulator and the sets I was using it with I never aligned or anything. This is the first time I've used it on like a fully you know, aligned with all really good tubes and so on. And uh, yeah, it's fantastic reception. But rejected the latter because it may have been confused with vitamins. Douglas Camfield was Now, so some of you may or may not know, the first couple seasons of Doctor Who, <laughs> a lot of the episodes got wiped out. They actually stored them on an early form of videotape, and at some point in the 70s, I think it was, they uh, accidentally erased a lot of the tapes. And the only fragments that exist are some still frames like these, or occasionally there was some home enthusiasts that pointed at like a a Super 8 camera at it, recorded it off a of TV. Uh, but amazingly, all the audio exists because people would record these uh, tape recorders at home. So they have all the, uh, every second of audio of every episode exists. So what some people have done have taken whatever scraps of photos and video clips they can find and reconstructed the episodes like this one. They're actually fairly watchable if you're a kind of a diehard fan like I am. <laughs> It's the only way you're going to see them, unfortunately. I'll give you five seconds to hand over that terrain. The terrain! Here's a portion of an episode that actually still does exist. Now I'm still broadcasting on Channel 9, which is not one that I actually tweaked or aligned. Uh, the ones I really focused on were Channels 3 and 4. So I'm going to switch over to those and see if the quality improves even more. Okay, I think we're on Channel 4 now. That's not so good. Transmitted through space. Yes, my friend. The many light years from Earth by now. Moving on a strange planet in a strange galaxy. The nature of which we can only guess at.
looks better. I fooled around with the transmitting antenna. So that's channel four. Let's try channel three. Ooh, that looks all right. That's a winner there, channel three. You know that might mean nothing. Here's a look at my crudely cobbled together transmitting setup. I've got a standard DVD player and the audio and video out are going to this blonder tongue agile modulator. Let's see, the label on the back says it is a model AM60-550. The 60, I believe, is the output power, and the 550 is the upper frequency. So in this case, 550 megahertz. You set the channel with these little dip switches here. So right now I have the first two set up, and you gotta, you gotta do this in hexadecimal. So if you had one and two together, you get channel three. And for the output, I just have the, uh, I just took a regular receiving antenna and hooked it up to the output. So I've got a, a bow in here going to the uh, twin lead, going to just one of my old vintage antennas. For lower frequencies, it helps to have the rabbit ears fully extended and kind of flattened out. For higher frequencies, this would be the active element. They show up on eBay all the time with the death of analog and TSC. Uh, there's really no commercial use for these anymore, so they show up a lot. There are numerous variations. There's also the BAVM series, which are fixed frequency. Like I've got one that's fixed channel 3 and channel 5. They cost less, and they're only about this deep, so that might be a little more practical. Cellular dissemination. Cellular what? To put it in lay language, cellular dissemination means our bodies were broken up by some process or other, shot through into the fourth dimension, and at a given point, reassembled again on the planet. That's fantastic! And so it another project comes to an end. I hope you guys enjoyed this series on restoring an Admiral 20X122. You know the one with the mic? Yes, that's one with the long tube, and I believe it's sending messages back to Earth. Now that would mean 